really wanted to focus on big gameplay systems that would basically force players to throw their existing strategies over their shoulder and try to figure out the whole thing all over again. So with religion, espionage, the uh, city-state system, the way that the combat works, there's just a lot of meat here for any average civilization fan to really dig into. It's great now that we have the expansion. We have 34 different civilizations to play. So that's a lot of choice right there. But once you latch on to a couple of your favorite civilizations, you tend to play them a lot and I don't like to play them the same way every time. A lot of the civilizations that we added have really unique and powerful traits because we didn't want it to be just a, a numbers game, but I'd wanted these all to feel like unique, cool gameplay elements that really fit in with the civilization that they were using. But we also wanted to reflect the fact that Carthage evolved out of the Phoenician sea power, and they actually were very good at establishing a trade network of port cities all around the Mediterranean coast. So they get free harbors, and then to reflect that ability to get up over the Alps and attack the Romans, they actually are the only civilization that can move units over mountains. Um, Austria is a really cool addition for a couple reasons. Um, Ed wanted it there to flesh out kind of the whole European experience. He's using it in, um, in his scenario into the Renaissance because it's part of that whole religious uh, conflict area that he wanted to go into. It's got a unique trait possibility that's really interesting. It's called diplomatic marriage that actually allows her to kind of absorb city-states. The Netherlands are an interesting civilization because they're all about trade. During their initial period when the Netherlands was first breaking away from Spain, they were kind of fighting a revolution. And one of the key um, elements uh, was what they called the sea beggars, which were sort of like naval um, pirate units that would come in and seize towns and uh, plunder uh, the Spanish uh, port towns along the coast of the Netherlands. And then also to reflect the Netherlands military and trading might, they have a unique improvement. And that's the polder, which is the filled in land from the sea where you'll see those huge fields of tulips. In terms of a fighting power of the time, I mean, you couldn't necessarily top Attila. We played around with his trade a little bit. We put in some neat and interesting fun things. Like he, he puts down his capital and it's called Attila's Court. And then he kind of steals the rest of his city names from everybody else in the game. So you might actually see some of those low-lying city names from everybody else's civilizations. And he's taken and he's using them for himself. And naturally, it's another horse culture. It'll fit really well with that whole Genghis feel of things. Now, the cool thing about Ethiopia is it's the only African country that was able to withstand the period of European colonization. So they're the only holdout that was never part of a European uh, colonial empire. And so we wanted to reflect that in their civilization's traits. So we wanted them to be very, very difficult to take out and conquer. And even though they might not be the biggest or the most powerful civilization, we still wanted them to be strong defensively. So that's the way their trait works. Anytime they're fighting a civilization that has more cities than they do, they get a very, very significant combat bonus. Some of them that have come up before, I, I hate to admit it, but I play with Bodica of the Celts probably in seven of every 10 games that I've been playing lately. Bodica's trait is faith-based. So um, I'm often playing an aggressive religion game. She makes it really easy to play a strong religion game. And they actually get faith from kills. And so if you want to cause trouble early in the game while you're on your own to religion, uh, the Pictish War is the way to do it. Having played Civ IV, I loved the way religion spread across the map and sort of had this historical uh, immersion element drawing you into the game. And it was very interesting to see, you know, where Buddhism spread and which civilizations adopted it and that kind of thing. But I wanted it to have more of an impact on the way the game played out. I wanted those religions to be very, very meaningful in terms of who had which ones and whether you could get the bonuses from one into your cities. Um, there are other more interesting unique units in the game as well. I mean, you mentioned Attila. His battering ram is absolutely devastating. He gets it as a spearman replacement. So it's not your typical unit replacement in that you're replacing the spearman with some other guy that kind of holds something like a spear. This is a complete change out for him. For instance, the range units where you kind of had a range unit early in the game, um, like an archer, and he would upgrade to a crossbowman, but after that there wasn't really much of a place for him to go. We've got a continuous path for those range units throughout the game. So aside from all the new civilizations that we have, the units, all the content that people generally like to see in an expansion, we also put in a lot of big new systems. I mean, we've overhauled the combat. We Obviously, religion, I'm sure a lot of people have read about, is a big new system, espionage. Uh, we've overhauled a lot of the AIs, the way the naval combat works, the way the city-state system works. So um, there's going to be a lot in there for a lot of people.